Welcome back, everybody, to the Dharma Doors. I'm MC Owens. And don't let them fool you. This is part 25 of the Akshayamati Bodhisattva Sutra. They're going to try to convince you that this is part 24. <laughs> there was a misnumbering somewhere. This is part 25. So we are well past an entire day. If, if that is conceivable, we're well past an entire 24 hours dedicated to this one tiny, tiny little sutra. And tonight we've arrived at this exciting, you would almost think it's the end of the sutra. <laughs> but we've reached this crescendo moment where, we're, where the bodhisattva, tiny little akshayamati bodhisattva, is about to abide in the 10th boomy stage. Cue the thunder, <sighs> cue the lightning. This is the, the, the end of the bodhisattva path, basically. This is the 10th stage. This bodhisattva has been experiencing these visions prior, prior to each stage. And the bodhisattva is now about to abide in the final stage of the bodhisattva path, the final Bhumi. Um, and we're going to find out what the bodhisattva will have a vision of right before that. Um, before we do that, though, I haven't done it for a while. So I want to, I want to kind of remind us of these stages. I know that stages ha ha can, can, can mean things, you know, I, I'm, I'm aware of language and that these words can mean things, right? And so I, you know, there's these, this idea of stages of development. Indeed, this is sort of a, a progress, a progress in that sense. And so, yes, these are stages, but I want to remind everyone that the word boomy, the, the stage, what a boomy means actually is a, a ground. And when we started the, the boomies, I probably, I would guess, talked about the boomy sparsha mudra, the mudra where the Buddha is touching the ground. So it's not the one where he has his hand out in the, in the, in the mudra of offering or giving or generosity. It's this interesting one where the hand is facing this way and it's touching the ground and touching sparsha, the ground, the boomy. That's the boomy sparsha. And so the most kind of basic rudimentary idea of a boomy is the ground, like ter the terra firma, as we might say. But then you, you know, I, rem I reminded us in that first session that this word boomy, it kind of pertains to these various meditative states. And so when a bodhisattva or just a, just a person in that sense is meditating and they sort of have transcended the realm of desire, they've transcended the kamadhatu and you might say they're abiding. They're abiding in the first jhana or the second jhana or the third jhana or the fourth. But the idea of their abiding, well, you could kind of say that the abiding is the verb and the noun of where, where that abiding is happening is in a, or on a bumi. And so the idea is, is that it, it's kind of a very interesting idea or metaphor where when you're walking around planet Earth, the boomy, the ground is indeed like the ground and, and you can touch the ground with your feet in that way. But when a meditator, when a bodhisattva begins to transcend sort of these realms, the earthly realms in that sense, they're abiding in different boomies. And so I wanted to remind everybody that the, the connotation of a boomy is not, I mean, it, it is about development and 
stages of development, but the word Bumi does not necessarily mean a stage or a this level. Maybe that's what I mean. That's what I want to say. You might want to translate it as like a level, like there's levels to this. There's levels to this Bodhisattva business. And in fact, there's 10 levels. And then when you talk about levels, you could get carried away with certain metaphors. And then we've missed it. It, it, we've missed that it's not a level, it's that it's terra firma. It's this idea of like the, the base, the ground, the fundament that upon which the bodhisattva is abiding. So I just wanted to, to remind us that these bumis are about, yes, we're transcending stages, but we are arriving at these new bases. And by the way, that's another transition is a base as well in that sense. And this is the 10th Bhumi, the 10th of such stages, which is called the Dharma Megha, the Dharma cloud. This, um, you, the, we're about to abide in it. Uh, so we're about to get a taste or a flavor for this Dharma Megha. Um, I wanna say a few things about Dharma. I want to say a few things about Megha, the cloud. I want to say a few things about Dharma Mega. And I also want to say a few things about the Paramita or the observance or the practice or the virtue, depending on how you want to translate Paramita. But I want to talk about the associated Paramita, the associated practice that sort of get ones, that gets one to the Dharma Mega stage or at least the idea is that the, this paramita is, is completed or fully cultivated in this dharma mega. And so the, let's just start with that. The, the paramita or the practice that is associated with this is called jnana, knowledge. And I've said this a bunch, so, so, so the, 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 the idea of tonight is like all knowledge, sarva jnana. And I've, I've made this point a lot that, of course, the root, this idea of jnana, that is the root idea, the root, even etymological root of a lot of Buddhist ideas. Ideas like samya, vijnana, pranya or pranyana. Um, I mean, there's a bunch that I could get into, which are all these different aspects of knowledge. What, what might be translated as perception, samnya, associ associative knowledge or something like that, right? Samnya, samnyana, transcendent jnana, that's pranya, right? Uh, vi, vijnana, which is uh, split or divided jnana, that's our consciousness is actually split jnana, vi jnana. And so what's interesting is, is that at this 10th stage, we're not talking about samya. We're not talking about vinyana. We're not even talking about pranya. We have, we're, we have reached the root of it, which is just jnana. Unqualified jnana, knowledge. And so that is the idea that we want to talk about tonight. I wanted to just put that out there that you know, this is sort of the stage of, 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 well, let me, okay, so let me back it up and I'll say this, I'll say this about this 10th stage. And I mentioned this last week, the 10th Bhumi stage is not Buddhahood. It's not, you're a Buddha now. This is the final stage of Bodhisattvahood. This is the final stage of the Bodhisattva path, but we're still Bodhisattvas in that way. And so there's something interesting going on with that, that in a sense, this is still a stage in the development. And this stage is associated with this development of a certain kind of knowledge. In fact, it is all knowledge or, or, some, or uh, sarva jnana, sarva jnana, all knowledge in that sense. And mm, I suppose since we're, we're going to spend the bulk of this evening 
talking about this vision that the Bodhisattva has before they get to this stage. So I don't know if we're going to get back to talking about it. So let me just say this. You know, you know what Dharma means, right? It, it means a lot of things. And so when we hear about a cloud, a cloud of Dharma, well, wow, okay. So, wow. So, you know, if, if, if we take it to mean like the truth, like capital T, the truth, wow, it's a cloud of truth. That's, inter that's, that would, that's interesting. If we take it to mean sort of like all of these wonderful teachings of the Buddha, right? The dharmas about like the Four Noble Truths are dharma. Those are truths. The Three Poisons are truths as well. Uh, these are all truths or principles. And so maybe it's a cloud of all the teachings, cloud of all the teachings, could be, it could be. There's a lot of, you know me, I never actually wanna say what it means. I think that's kind of not as much fun, you know, to just say, this is what it means. So there's all these things going on with Dharma that it could be all of these different things. In fact, if we take it all the way down, the word Dharma can mean some, a thing, anything, you name it, a concept, an idea, a flavor, a taste, an emotion, a planet. It, 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 it's an idea or a concept. And Buddhists use the word Dharma to refer to any particular concept. So, oh, wow, now it's a cloud of all concepts. <laughs> we could definitely hang out in a cloud of all concepts for, for a while, right? Those are all totally viable in terms of Dharma, that it could mean the, 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 the truth, truths, or sort of just like the cloud of all phenomena. So those are some options for Dharma. We talk about Dharma every Sunday, so I don't need to really go through that. But what about this cloud, right? This is like, this is a, a momentous occasion that the Bodhisattva has reached this Dharma cloud. And I kind of wanted to start tonight by saying this particular definition of the cloud. I, again, there's a, there's a lot. Okay, the, the one that I want to tell you about, the one that I came to tell you about, we're setting that over here for a moment, all right? We're just going to set that one over here because there's a number of different um, things going on with clouds. Um, one that actually comes to mind that is part of sort of the Buddhist tradition, you might have played this game. Have you ever played the game where you've looked up at some clouds and seen shapes, animals or faces or whatever? And it's like, oh, hey, look, I see the, the face. And then you kind of watch it sort of disappear. There is an interesting Buddhist metaphor for this like ability to see things in clouds, right? And if you think about that, like that's a funny, interesting thing about perception. I mentioned samya, right? I mentioned perception. Well, it's an interesting thing about perception, right? That you can kind of like look into something like a cloud and start to see discernible features. We might call them lakshana. We might even go so far as to call them characteristics and qualities, right? Where it's like, oh, look, that looks like an ear and it looks like two ears or my favorite, it looks like a dragon's tail, right? Oh, it looks like a big dragon with smoke coming out of its you know, mouth. Oh, so that's a beautiful thing about clouds. And, and you know, do I have to point out the Buddhist metaphor there? This idea that we can look into and I don't know, an amorphous cloud of dharmas and see things. Oh, I don't know, like a clock or I don't know what you see. I see a clock, right? So there's a funny way in which you can start to see all phenomena as like dharma clouds. And I think if you are starting to see all phenomena as like little dharma clouds, you're approaching the 10th boomy stage in that way, because that might be one interpretation of the Dharma cloud. 
And that's a good way of thinking of the Dharma realm or the Dharma Dhatu that we've spoken about, you know, where there's this sort of really amorphous coming and going and shifting and all of that. And, and in particular, the ability for the observer to see whatever they want to see in there. In fact, it's kind of like a mirror looking at a cloud in that way, where you're seeing the impressions of your own mind. There's not a dragon there. There's not a face there. It's the conditioning of your mind, which is the ability to see two circles close enough together and be like, oh, look, it's eyeballs, and so on and so forth. So we could go with that. Again, I, I've seen I've seen that interpretation of clouds in Buddhism before, and I, I dig it. You clearly, I dig it. But there's other ways to interpret the cloud. There's definitely one about its um, it's like um, um, floaty floatiness, shall we say, right? This uh, um, that you know, that beautiful book by Milan Kundera, right? The unbearable lightness of being. A cloud definitely speaks to a certain lightness of being, a, a levity, which is a beautiful word, by the way, levity, you know, versus gravity, levity. And clouds speak of a levity, a really, really gentle floatiness, that I think is very um, intentional in the metaphor, you know, cause it's like, if I were to think of, oh, I don't know, a waterfall. <laughs> if I were to think of a waterfall right now, although it is as nebulous, shall we say, as a cloud, as indistinct and fluid and Who's the guy, the Greek guy, Heraclitus, that can't put his same foot in, or can't put his foot in the same river twice? He can't even put his same foot in the same river twice, frankly. But that that Heraclitus, that idea of like you can't put your foot in the same river twice, waterfall, amorphous clouds, sure. But when I think of a waterfall, it's like it's there, it's present, it's powerful. <laughs> a cloud is like. Again, it's nebulous, floaty, and there's many a uh, there's many a Buddhist monk and nun whose Dharma name includes the word cloud, cloud of virtue, or something like that. And the cloud is very much about this sort of, um, you know, the Buddhists will talk about how clouds um, will rain. If clouds come over and they rain, they'll rain uh, equanimously. Uh, you know, unlike the peanuts, unlike uh, Linus, who it is, who has the little cloud over him all the time and nobody else has the little cloud over him. In reality, clouds are indiscriminate. Clouds rain equally on the rich and poor alike, shall we say. And so there's a certain equanimity to clouds in Buddhism where they, again, they rain indiscriminately. And there's a certain, um, this is another one I read a while ago that I liked. Clouds don't, ba they basically don't obey borders. <laughs> they'll float right over your border. <laughs> they'll, fight, they'll float right over your border wall, right? And this, this beautiful idea of clouds being untethered by, worldly things like national borders and things like that. I could go on and on with all of these beautiful cloud metaphors. Yeah, Tanya. And they're ephemeral. Exactly. That, that, and that's actually, that's part of the, thank you. That's the way they shape shift in the first example I gave is also part of this general levity where they, they shift and morph. You can never grab them in that way. There's also, um, by the way, the, the Buddhist also recognized a certain, um, how shall I put this? They recognized the, uh, the mystery of condensation. And what I mean by that is, is that they recognize that clouds sort of appear miraculously. You don't actually see the water of the ocean 
evaporating into the air and forming a cloud and then moving over the land and raining. It's much more invisible than that, the whole process. In fact, the Buddhists, I, I read this recently the other day that the Nagas, that it's actually part of the Naga mythology that the Nagas are creating sort of the clouds out of the ocean in a way, but mysteriously, which is, you know, Nagas are mysterious that way. <laughs> But none of those, none of those are the cloud metaphor that I wanted to 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 talk about. Um, and already time's getting a bias. Oh my gosh! So the cloud metaphor that I want to share, that I would like to sort of, you know, set the tone or the mood for tonight. The cloud metaphor, and in particular the Dharma cloud, the Dharma mega. So now let's put all of this together. Put all those together. And imagine this kind of transient, ephemeral, amorphous cloud of truth and knowledge and tr Buddha truths raining indiscriminately on all sentient beings, right? What a big part of the cloud metaphor, in particular, again, the Dharma cloud, the Dharma mega, is that if you are aware if you are aware that the word for craving, for wanting, if you're aware that in Sanskrit that word is tanha, which means thirst. So this, this problem, this wanty, clingy, needy problem that is basically the root of the problem. Yes, it makes us angry and all this stuff, but it's like, it's really this needy wantiness that's at the root. And it's interesting that the that Buddhists or the Buddha called this thirst. We translate it as craving, but the word is actually a thirst. And the metaphor, of course, for that thirst or that craving is that it is, it is an unslakeable thirst if you're trying to please it with worldly things in that way. And that's the idea is that this craving, it's, it's, it's insatiable with worldly delights. And I don't mean to say that it is, it is satiable with extra or super uh, worldly delights. I don't mean to say that, that if you go to heaven, you, this can be satisfied. That's what the Buddha came to tell us. You can go to heaven. You can be reborn as a God. And this craving will actually not be satisfied even by the amrita, even by the ambrosia of the gods. This thirst cannot be slaked. The craving, the wanting, it cannot be satisfied. But what there is, and this is the noble truth, is that there is not wanting. That solves the problem, so to speak. And what they say is, is that the Dharma is that, that the Dharma is that, the teaching about not wanting, the teaching that, that, that teaches us about the dangers of craving and wanting and this and that and leading to our own suffering and be aware and this and that. And so the idea is, is that the Buddhists use this metaphor that the Dharma is that rain that slakes that thirst. It's a beautiful metaphor. You know, please don't, you know, get it confused as more than a metaphor in that way. In that the teaching is about not, the, not craving, not wanting. And so there is a teaching for how not to do that. And that is that solves the problem in that way. The other way, which will lead you in samsara forever, the other way is thinking, no, 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 this will do it. No, 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 oh, no, this will do it. Oh, oh, no. And all the way down, any idea, no, 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 but this satisfaction will do it, or this will do it. The, the dharma, the noble truth is that none of it will do it. What will do it, though, is not craving, not clinging, not wanting in that way. Okay, so that's my Dharma cloud introduction. Are we ready for the vision? 
That's the real question. So a bodhisattva who's about to abide in this stage of the Dharma cloud will first have this vision. So when a bodhisattva, and I'm reading from the standard translation, when a bodhisattva is about to abide in the stage of the Dharma cloud, Dharma mega, the 10th boomy stage, they will first have a vision of themselves, their body the color of true real gold, complete with all the 32 auspicious marks of a Tathagata and haloed with a circle of light several feet in radius. They will be seated comfortably on a broad high lion throne and surrounded by innumerable hundreds of thousands of millions of Nayutis of Brahma gods who will respectfully make offerings to them and listen to them preaching the Dharma. That's the vision that I have attempted to portray in marker on this board. <laughs> um, there's a lot of elements to this vision. And so we're gonna go through them piece by piece. Um, I've been saying this all along that I've been really happy that I've been decided to do this. This was sort of really out of nowhere to decide to go through all of these this way, but I'm really happy I did because going slowly through them, it's really helped me see these really subtle uh, qualities to each of these that are, have been building up and building up and building up. And so there's a way in which this last one sort of really encapsulates all of them. Um, there's a lot going on. There's a lot going on. And so we're going to dive in. Um, first thing, the first aspect of this, and I'm just doing these in order. I'm going to do them in the order in which they were presented. Um, so they're going to first, and I kept the uh, our Bodhisattva Akshayamati sort of right where he has been, because this is the same language. The last four visions have been the same idea of like seeing oneself in these different situations. Remember earlier, the visions were sort of like seeing all these flowers everywhere or seeing all these jewels everywhere. And so those were sort of visions. Again, I've said this almost every night. I don't know if these are dreams, if they're daydreams, if they are understandings. But the idea is, is that the last series of these have been these visions of oneself in these different situations. And now the final one is this vision of oneself with the body of pure gold. The text seems to be wanting us to not... Um, uh, uh, the text in Sanskrit and Chinese, it seems to not want us to miss that it's it's like re almost real gold. <laughs> it's not like yellow. It's not gold colored. That the vision is is a body of gold. Okay, <laughs> so there's so there's that, and and a lot of things come to mind of what that could possibly mean. I think there's a lot of ways to understand it. Like everything I've been talking about tonight, there's a lot of ways to understand it. The first thing that I wanna remind you of is that if you've been coming to Dharma doors, this isn't the first time we've heard this. The Malakirti Sutra is a great uh, place that comes to mind. There's a chapter where the Malakirti creates a bodhisattva that has a body of pure gold that goes to another realm to get some food offerings from a Buddha in another realm. And this gold being brings them back. There was another sutra that we read in the Dharma doors where there was a, um, 
I forget her name, but she was a young, uh, a young girl who was, you know, uh, teaching the Dharma to a bunch of monks. And at a certain point, she caused her body to be the color of pure gold. And it is one of the 32 auspicious signs that is mentioned in the text that we're going to talk about. It is one of the 32 auspicious marks or one of the 32 auspicious signs that an enlightened being has a body the color of gold. So those are a, a few, just a few little reminders or references to this golden body in Buddhism as it pertains to an enlightened being. Since we're talking about it, I do then want to talk about these 32 marks. I, I will say more about the golden body because the text, the text makes such a point about it that I want, I definitely want to talk about it but I need to start talking about these 32 auspicious signs. So this is where it all gets really, really interesting. There is this idea of these 32 lakshana. That's the Sanskrit word, lakana, or something to that effect is the Pali word. But it's this idea for these 32 lakshana marks, signs, characteristics, traits. There's a bunch of different ways that Lakshana can be translated. And they, you know, we talk about them almost again, every Sunday night, at some point we wind up talking about these characteristics. And these characteristics or qualities are, they're very simple, but they're so wildly profound. And that's actually what all of this is about. <laughs> actually, now that I've really stopped to think about it. So, you know, a characteristic or a quality or a lakshana, everything has them. In fact, the, the how you know what something is, is because it's, it's, it has these qualities, you know, and so if it's, yellow and curved and sweet and you can eat it. Those are the characteristics and qualities of a banana. Yellow, curved, sweet, you can eat it. And it goes on and on and on. And then of course, if it was a little baby banana, one of those little ones, oh look, we have another characteristic or quality. It's a baby little banana. Michael? The, yeah, oh yeah, Connie. Hey. What's <laughs> Important question because it just came to my mind. Love when it. you say, is this very, is this correct? You just said the banana has these qualities. Does that mean the banana has the qualities or we agree on certain qualities? Even crazier. Even, option number three, door number three. Good call. Bodhisattva Kani always on Pranya Patrol. Oh, she's always on Pranya Patrol because she's like, wait a minute, banana, it doesn't have any lot. So indeed, Connie, I misspoke. The banana or whatever doesn't have these characteristics, but that is an enlightened view of a bodhisattva, indeed. Because for the most part, we are convinced that these objects have those qualities. Like you might be convinced that this is a, a blue hoodie it's blue day, and so I got a blue hoodie on. And you might be convinced that this is blue. I don't actually, Connie, I'm gonna pause because I, we're not here right now, right now. We're not here to get into the nitty gritty of the pranya and the wisdom and emptiness and all of that. So and to answer your question or your inquiry, what we are interested in right now is it's, it goes back to how that train of thought started, which is how would I know what that is? How would I, what do, you, what do you got there? Oh, it's yellow. Oh, it's curved. Oh, it's sweet. Oh, I can eat it. Okay, then yes, in an agreed upon conventional language sense, Connie, through language, I'm going to call because we all do 
do in English call that which is curved, yellow, sweet, and you can eat it. We call those bananas. So it's a convention language game. Yes, Connie. Pranya says the characteristics and qualities are not actually possessed by that object. That's delusional. But I'm more, more interested in this, the thing that I said before that, which was, what is that? Oh, it's yellow, curved, sweet, and I can eat it. Got it. It's a banana. Now what we're going to do is we're going to look over there. And we're going to be like, whoa, who's that? Oh, they have a protrudence out of the top of their head and a white tuft of hair in between their eyes and their feet are level. And they have a chest like a lion and a golden body and a halo of light and 30 other pieces. That must be a Buddha. That, no, it's not a banana. It's a Buddha because it has these 32 lakshana. So that, that was the end of, of my spiel which was that interestingly, these 32 characteristics are how you can tell a Buddha or in the language of the text, a Tathagata, an enlightened being, it's how you can tell an enlightened being from a banana. In, in other words, meaning that everything that we perceive and understand is understood. Now, you know, Connie, man, now you got me on, I'm my, I got to watch all my words. Now. <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> but the idea is, is that when we perceive things, we understand everything as through their laks lakshana in that way. And without getting into the pranya, which I've, I've been trying to avoid in this way, what these 32 characteristics are, are the, and by the way, you may know this already, these are auspicious. Lakshana. Oh, so that's something else. But what I mean to say, though, is, is these are still, I mean, they, we, these are still being spoken about as Lakshana. But the difference is, the interesting difference is, is that, oh, these are the 32 unique, auspicious qualities of an enlightened being. And these 32, and, and my main point before I forget it again, these 32 characteristics, this idea that an enlightened being could be perceived by their, these marks, this is an old idea. This is not a Buddhist idea per se. This is one of those ideas that has, that seems to have been around India for a very, very, very long time. And so wouldn't you know it, the Buddhists, the Buddhists do this thing where they take an existing Indian tradition and they flip it. And not only that, they're, the Buddhists are going to flip it again and flip it again and just keep flipping this idea. It gets really, 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 really wild. This particular idea of the 32 Lakshana. And so again, this is a pre-Buddhist idea. And so I do actually want to read to you all 32 and give you a quick, a very quick possible interpretation of what these 32 things represent. Again, I don't ever want to um, say what these things mean. I don't want to say what they're supposed to mean, what they're not supposed to mean, anything like that. But for the sake of time and all of that, I'm going to just say a few words about them. And, bef and before I do, because I'm reading the kind of the basic original list, remember, this is not Buddhist. <laughs> this is pre-Buddhist. This is about like uh, the concept of an enlightened being. And uh, actually, before I read these, the Buddha has said something several times. And I want to remind you that this original old idea of a, I think the idea was a Mahapurusha, a great person. It doesn't get more broad in general than the idea of a Mahapurusha, a great person. 
but a great person had these marks. But then last time, or maybe the time before, I forget which Sunday, we talked about the wheel turning king, the wheel turning sage king. Wheel turning kings, which might be Emperor Ashoka, it might be uh, Kanishka the Great. There's different, you know, people, historical figures who have been called Chakravartins, wheel turning kings. And they also are said to display these 32 marks. And so these 32 marks are used to describe this great person, maybe a wheel turning king. This person has level feet. I like to think they got both feet on the ground. You know, you know what I'm saying? Got both feet on the ground. <laughs> Number two, but, but, and again, if anybody wants to, to, you know, say anything more about these, but I really, okay. I, 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 I've heard level feet and I'm like, no arches? Well, what's funny is, what's funny is, is that number seven is that they have arched in, in their, the, the inside of their foot is arched. Okay. So it doesn't mean that. And that's why I got to wonder, well, what do they mean? Level feet. Yeah. Uh, and as you go through this, just a question, like yeah. there's 32 of them. Is the order important or does it? Yes, it is. I, I actually ne didn't really pay much attention to it, but our sutra, our Akshaya Mati Bodhisattva Sutra here has got me looking for all kinds of things now. And so indeed the 32 marks do seem to move from the bottom of the feet all the way to the very top of the head, the Ushnisha. So they move in a chakra-esque way um, going up. In fact, number two is these thousand spoked wheels on the bottoms of the feet. Oh, and level feet by the, oh, now that I remember, I'm, I'll remember things too, as, as, as happens. I have seen level feet not translated as level, but translated basically to mean that they're both the same length. Both feet are the same length. It's like a, a sense of, of uh, evenness in that way. But again, I would encourage everybody to be looking for a poetic meaning to these things and not a physical meaning, although these are physical because they're lakshana. Thousand spoke wheels on the inside of the feet, which was the original symbol or lakshana of a wheel turning king, a chakravartan. Um, long, slender, fingers, but I do believe in the original language, it is like digits. So it's both toes and fingers in that way. But traditionally it is known as long slender fingers, pliant hands and feet, number four, pliant, okay. Number five is interesting both on the toes and the fingers, a little webbed. webbed, webbed hands and toes, webbed fingers and toes, full-sized heels. So we're still on the bottom of the feet there and we're talking about full-sized heels, arched insteps, thighs, like a royal stag, thighs like a horse. This is an interesting one. Hands that when the, the Buddha is standing, reach below the knee. So the fingertips are below the knee, which those are long arms. Those are long arms. Number 10, number 10 is probably going to be the most controversial among the 10 because number 10 is the retractable penis. Now, <laughs> this is a, they say like a horse, also birds are like this too, where their genitalia go very inward. 
one could say, oh, wow. So you're saying the Buddha was hung like a horse? I've heard the joke before. I'm not the first person to make the joke. So, but you could, you could see this idea of a retractable uh, penis that goes in as being like, wow, that's a really weird feature. But it could also mean someone who is in, or a male in this case, who is in total control of their sexuality. That could, you could, you could read it that way, or you could get physical about some sort of retractable penis in that way. But I just, again, I'm lending you possibilities for other things. Also, by the way, the reason why I'm making such a big deal about this list being pre-Buddhist is because within the Buddhist world, at least depending on who you talk to, right? There's, the Buddha is beyond gender. The Buddha is beyond male and female in that way. And so in, when we get to talking about the 32 marks in Buddhism, this one takes on a whole other meaning in that sense. So I just wanna make everybody clear that this is, that the Buddhist didn't come up with the idea, oh, the, and he should have a retractable penis. The Buddhist came into a world in which that was a fixation or a fascination with people already. Everybody okay with that one? <laughs> okay. Um, this is an interesting one. Height and outstretched arms, same length. Like the Da Vinci antediluvian man. If you've ever seen the image of the uh, Leonardo da Vinci's antediluvian man, that image of the, the man who has his arms outstretched like this, but then also the legs outstretched. You might have seen the sketch of Da Vinci. He was pointing out the symmetry of this length, sorry, the, this length with this length. And apparently a, a Buddha or an enlightened person, it's exactly the same. Whereas for many of us, it's, it's a little different in that way. This is a fun one, number 12. Every hair or every root hair, dark colored. So you've seen images of the Buddha always having this kind of dark curly hair in that way, but that's an interesting one. Number 14 is the golden body. Wait, I'm on 13. Level feet, thousand spoked wheels on the bottom of the feet long slender fingers and toes, pliant hands and feet, toes and fingers slightly webbed is number five, mm -hmm. full-sized heels, number six, arched insteps, number seven, thighs like a royal stag, number eight, hands that go below the knees is number nine. Mm -hmm. This retractable penis is number 10. Their height and outstretched arms equal length is number 11. And number 12 is this every hair root dark colored. Right. We good? Yep. So we're on 13. We're on number 13. Got it. All body hair, graceful and curly. And also, by the way, when you're working on your own interpretation of these, also, of course, keep in mind the rough, rough translation of these words right, that often what happens in translation is words have double entendres, double meanings and things like that. And so just be open to the possibility that you're also getting a very rough translation of these. All right. Number 14 was the golden hued body. Number 15 is our aura that is mentioned also in the vision. So the vision says that the Bodhisattva will have this vision of themselves with a halo. This one in Chinese, it's specifically eight feet or the equivalent of what would be eight feet in diameter. I've heard 10 feet. Uh, this one actually says 10 feet. So, you know, somewhere between eight and 10 feet, a halo of light. Number 16 is soft, smooth skin. Number 17 
is our rounded shoulders like a lion. And that was one that the Bodhisattva already started to display a few visions ago. And actually, there's a number of these coming up, which are the lion-like qualities. And I just want to point out that these 32, these 32 signs started to appear a few visions ago. And then we got a few more. And so the language, the language of our vision here, if you remember, is that the Bodhisattva will have a vision of themselves, their body, the color of real gold, and they will have all 32 signs complete or completely. It's the translation is tricky. Their translation is tricky. Chinese is weird. But the idea is, is that the Bodhisattva has been developing these. And at this stage, they have all 32. So I just want to point that out because we're about to get some some uh, replica or uh, repeats from last week. Number 18, the area below the armpits is filled in. Interesting. Number 19 is a lion shaped body. And I would refer you to the night that we spent on the lion image and about courage and all of this to think about the lion shaped body. Number 20, erect upright body. The Buddha does not slouch. Number 21, full round shoulders. So they're real big on these round shoulders, right? I gotta work on my round shoulders, I'm telling you. Number 22, 40 teeth exactly. I don't know, how many teeth are people supposed to have? How many am I, like, how many am I missing? 30, 36 now, 32 or 30, I think children 32 and we with four. With the uh, wisdom? Yeah, like we, 36. It, mm -hmm. So if we had all our wisdom, because I got mine pulled, man, I lost my chance at Buddhahood. But if I, I'm kidding. But you get your wisdom teeth pulled, but if you didn't get them pulled, so you're telling me you got 36 usually? Yes, I think so. Oh, so the Buddha got another set of two coming in, another four coming in, like extra teeth. Wow. Wisdom teeth, come on. So number 23, those teeth, by the way, those 40 teeth, clean and white all the time interesting good good dental habits maybe i don't know number 24 four canine teeth pure and white so canine incisors interesting well i guess that would go with number 25 a jaw like a lion so here's so we have a body like a lion a jaw like a lion teeth kind of in the lion family i mean they're they're canine but still so there's the, the lion ones are many in here. 26, 26 is something you have to appreciate as a lakshana. Saliva that improves the taste of food. I, that's a pretty good uh, quality to have, I would say. And so since we're in talking about the teeth, talking about the, the canines, talking about the jaw, talking about the saliva, number 27, a, a lightened person, a Mahapurusha has a long, broad tongue. And what I love, oh, so I don't, because time, yeah, time's not on my side tonight. So I'm gonna tell you right now, and then we'll talk about the golden body in a second, but I wanna tell you like about this one, for example, a tongue, a tongue long and broad. This is a, again, the, these 32 that I'm reading, they're pre-Buddhist, maybe even by a thousand years, who knows, right? So the Buddhas, the Buddhists come along and they say, oh yeah, Oh, the Buddha, he's, yeah, he's got the 32 Lakshana, all right. In fact, he has a tongue so big, when he unfurls it, it wraps around the whole world. 
It's that broad and that big. So when you hear that, when you hear the Buddhists, and this is what I mean by this is the Buddhist twist. They took this original list of 32 and then they made it their own by saying, oh yeah, the Buddha. Well, yeah, I mean, if a wheel turning sage king or a Maha Purusha or whoever, if they have a big long tongue, then the Buddhas wraps around the whole world. So this is what I mean by the, the Buddhists take these 32 and they take it to that next level in that sense. And it's wonderful. And for me, when I read it, I go like, oh, oh, so that's maybe what a long, broad tongue means, that it reaches a lot of people. It is a, a Chakravartin or Mahaprabhu or whoever is someone whose voice, their tongue, reaches a lot of people. Oh, isn't that a really beautiful poetic way to say that, that they have a long, broad tongue? And isn't it wild to say that the Buddha's is so big, it wraps around the whole world, right? Because he's been translated into more languages, right? Than you know, all of these different ideas. So again, because I'm not sure I'm going to get back to the full Mahayana twist on all of these, I wanted to put that one in there. Oh, and as we get to the last series of these, <laughs> you will definitely start to hear, it, it'll be almost like I'm reading a sutra in terms of the way this is about to go. So the last ones are that the Buddha has number 28, a deep resonant voice, eyes deep blue like, like lotus flowers. That's number 29, by the way. Number 30, eyelashes like a royal bull. And then number 30, the urna, the white tuft of hair in between the eyebrows that emits light. And number 32 is a fleshy protrudence from the crown of the head called an ushnisha. And so that one, the urna and the ushnisha, of course, we've reached the, the head and the whole top of the enlightened being in that way. Okay, any questions before I talk about probably the golden body one? Okay, and everybody's good with this idea of, of uh, these being the marks or lakshana by which you can see an enlightened being in that way, right? So in general, it would seem that the golden body, it would seem that it represents a fully purified body of everything in that way. That it's definitely, sort, or it seems to be a mark of purity in that sense. That's kind of seems obvious. The one, again, I'm not trying to give anybody the definitive definition of the, this, the one that comes to my mind that I find the most interesting regarding this sort of gold as reflective and luminous in that way, the one thing that I, I don't know if I said this, so I'm going to say it in it, like, I'm going to say it entirely because I'm not sure I said it at all. It's, it's this idea that these 32 Lakshana are auspicious. They're not like regular old Lakshana. They are, they are like regular old Lakshana in that they are how you can tell you're perceiving an enlightened being versus a banana, right? So I'm going to stick to that example in that these are Lakshana in that sense, but they're not quite like yellow, like a banana is yellow, or curved, like a banana is curved. And the part of the idea is, and I think I did say this, but again, I'm gonna say it in its entirety. 
you may perceive me, Michael, as being with the hair bun and I don't know, maybe you see me as male or choose to in that way or what have you. The guy with the blue, blue hoodie, um, the guy that sounds like this, I guess, right? <laughs> like the, these Lakshana in that way. And these are the way that you are like, oh, it's Michael teaching Dharma, Dharma doors. I, I've tuned into the right Zoom room because I recognize him. The idea of these 32 Lakshana, I would suggest a way of thinking of them. And what I'm suggesting is how to think of that qualifier auspicious, that these are auspicious Lakshana, auspicious signs and not regular, they're auspicious. And so what I would suggest is, is that in the perception game of reality in which we are discriminating things and discerning things and figuring out what things are, that, that there is this um, thing that happens basically, it would seem, in which an enlightened person ceases to be recognized by their kind of physical qualities in that way and is more recognized by these 32 special qualities. And if you're thinking about them physically, then again, review tonight's talk, because the idea was is even though these are described as physical, like 40 teeth, I think if you get hung up on like, okay, say, ah, let, uh, let me count them, buddy, because I'm not going to trust you that you're really teaching me the Dharma until I count all your teeth and I know that you have 40. If you get kind of hung up on the literal physical representation of these things, then you might miss something in that, in that way. And what I mean is, is you might miss the Mahayana twist on all of this. And so in the world of Buddhism, not just the Buddha, but bodhisattvas and other enlightened beings are described as developing these 32 auspicious signs or marks as, again, as signs of their enlightenment. And in this particular vision, of course, the bodhisattva is having a vision of themselves with these marks and signs. So questions, comments, or ideas about all of that, any of that? So are you saying that enlightened beings can actually be? I was so, <laughs> I was so waiting for you to finish that. And then I was, oh, wow, that was the question. <laughs> um, Could it be that the present is enlightened? so that a being is enlightened and they don't have to wait like a hundred years for the being to of enlightenment i you know i mean i'm i'm really it is a great great question you know and i uh, certainly i don't you know if i'm gonna if i provide any answer you know it's going to be some um, you know, I don't know what it's going to be. It's coming. Seizing. Seizing easy. Oh, no, no. I mean, it's such a good question. It's such a good question. I think <sighs> oh, well, I, yeah, because there's so many, so many things that comes to mind. The, yeah, this is, this is where it gets really, really tricky because no, the, the answer is no. Uh, Buddha's sort of, you know, are enlightened beings in this sense. Ah, see, yeah, this is where I'm getting stuck. Are we talking about enlightened beings or are we talking about Buddhas? What I mean to say is, is remember, this is not, this is, we're not even in the 10th stage. This is a vision we're going to have before we're in the 10th stage. Then we got to hang out in the 10th stage for a while. Then there's Buddhahood. And so on that note, yeah, this is the answer I was looking for. Mm -hmm. 
this is the answer I was looking for. Buddhas, like beyond the 10th stage, neither exist nor don't exist. Neither are nor are not, are completely beyond all dualities, are you know, neither nor in every possible way. That's Buddhas though. We're still down here in our, we're practicing our, we're Bodhi, you know? And what I mean is we're still playing the perception game in, in a certain way. I'm st I still got bananas. I got bananas over here. I got, uh, you know, I got stuff going on. And so to the degree, yes, this is the answer. To the degree to which we are still in the land of perception, the degree to which we are still in the whole language game and all of that, I do absolutely need to be able to distinguish a banana from a Buddha. In, and I and don't know Zen masters in the audience telling me about bananas having the Buddha nature and all of that. It's not about that. What I mean is, is that this tradition, I, I don't say this enough, this tradition is not in any way nihilistic in that sense. We are not striving for some sort of uh, philosophical resolution of everything. And, and, and this sort of, what I mean is, is that we do not throw everything out. And because there's, there's a sort of a risk in that of going too far with throwing all of this stuff out. And so, again, until we're beyond, beyond, gate, gate, paragate, parasamgate, until we are gone, gone, very gone, we are still in the perception game. And in that game, we need to know our enlightened beings from our unenlightened beings in that sense. I hope that kind of answers the question about their, the, these enlightened beings being or not. Ho hopefully, kind of, sort of. Everybody, everybody there? Everybody okay? You know, Michael, um, we, but we don't need to talk about it um, if that's not part of the, the, um, the content today. I. What you just said, I there's something that is coming up and that's resisting for me in the sense of like when you say, and maybe I'm coming from new age spirituality, I don't know, but this kind of like until we become, until we become, and mm -hmm. what or who should become, you know, mind itself, the ego will always be because this, that, that's, the, that's, that's the characteristics of mind always be conditioned, you know, like it, and, and that what already is, and let's in Buddhism, you call it Buddha nature, doesn't become, it, it's not going anywhere. It's not, so um, I, I have a, not a problem but um there's some resistance coming up when you say becoming you know that yeah becoming. excellent perfect thank you excellent so let me let me be clear about what i mean i yes uh, you caught me again connie on my bad use of language until we become bad language until we stop clinging until we stop craving there's this reality and me and you and differentiation and suffering and see the four noble truths, all of that. And, and so the irony of all of this is it's, it's actually a doing that is the problem, a doing of wanting, a doing of clinging, a doing of thinking and overthinking. And so this is a process towards not clinging, not craving, not attaching, and ultimately not thinking deludedly. I don't want to say it's not thinking. We don't turn into zombies, but we stop thinking deludedly in that way. Does that make sense, Connie? Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome question. And it's such a good question because it, it makes me say those things. And then that's, it wouldn't have happened otherwise. And that's how this Dharma thing works. Awesome. All right. 
I have a few more things to say about the vision because we have two more, three more elements. Seated high on a broad high lion throne, surrounded by Brahma gods, and those Brahma gods are making offerings to our Bodhisattva Akshayamati. So the lion throne I talked about because we spent a whole night on the lion imagery in Buddhism. And so, and I spoke about how, um, or I read, I read the great section from the Praniparamita Shastra, where it told us the Buddha is not sitting on a lion. The Buddha is not sitting on a, a throne with lions. A Buddha is not sitting on a seat or a chair. This lion's throne is about this sort of, again, this sovereignty, independence, courage, bravery, pride in that, in the good sense, what they, what they would call Vajra pride. Those are all these elements of the lion. And, you know, I, 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 I read something that night that we talked about the lion. And I wanted to remind everybody that this, the lion metaphor, the courage, the bravery, these things, the sense is that, you know, these things come naturally to the lion. The lion's not trying to impress the other animals. The lion's certainly not trying to, uh, in the metaphor, no, don't go zoologist on me. But the lion is not trying to instill fear in the other beings. The other beings just fear the lion, but it's not the lion's sort of intention in that way. They can't help being so big and bad in that sense. And what I mean is, is that these, these qualities that of the lion that are being celebrated, like bravery and courage, they don't require, they don't require the subjugation of another, if that makes sense. In order for me to be brave, I don't need to be have, I don't need somebody to be in fear of me in that way. And so there, I want to make that clear about the, the, the feelings about this lion and now seated on this broad high lion throne. That's, um, well, that's about the lion metaphor and what it would mean to sit on a lion throne. But there's some other stuff going on with this lion throne. I don't want to, um, I don't know enough about it. So I'm just putting this out there for other people to go look into if they're curious. There does seem to be some sort of correlation between the lion's throne, which our Bodhisattva is seated on, and the constellation Leo. And the constellation Leo, which is the lion, is also the Simha, is also the lion constellation in Indian astrology as well. So it's interesting that cross cultures, that particular constellation is considered a lion. And what I have heard, but the reason why I'm just putting this out there is because I have yet to track down the actual sources. There seems to be a sense that, again, as a metaphor or what have you, that when one is at the 10th stage in that sense, when one is displaying the 32 marks of a superhuman, when one is in that state, there is a transcendence of the physical body, right? Which would have all these lakshana, right? This is the body that's six feet tall. That's this lakshana. The characteristics or qualities of the enlightened being, that body is huge. And what they say is in a way, or again, what I've heard is that that body is so huge that the entire constellation of Leo is their throne. That it's like an astral, an astral abode, an astral throne, an astral chair or something like that. Again, I put that out there for people to dig deeper into. I'm not exactly sure. There does seem to be uh, the constellation of Leo does seem to have Buddhist connections, but I have yet to dig all the way deep into that stuff. So that's all I got to say about the lion's throne is the independence and sovereignty, courage and bravery, 
and maybe some sort of exalted Samboga Kaya seat or something like that, maybe. And finally, the last part of our vision is that we will see ourselves, bodies all of gold, halo of light, seated on a lion's throne, surrounded by these Brahma gods making offerings to us. So I have here, I've did, I did my best, you know me with my stick figure drawings, uh, but they're making offerings. This, this Brahma god is offering light, offering light beams. That's a very Buddhist thing to offer. This Bodhisattva is offering a jewel, the, or Brahma God, I should say. This Brahma God is offering incense, because that's a classic thing. So offering all this incense, flowers. You got to offer flowers to the Buddha. Music, so our divine drummer. It, and what I, I was excited because the drum is giving off jeweled music, M musical jewels, right, being offered to the Buddha. And then, of course, our parasol, our beautiful umbrella, a jeweled, jeweled parasol. So these offerings are being made to our bodhisattva in the 10th stage by these Brahma gods. And I probably don't need to tell you, but I will say it. This is very interesting because it was the thing that I, I started to pick up on earlier. And then I was like, wait a minute, what's happening here? And indeed, you will notice that at this 10th stage, the bodhisattva is surrounded by celestial beings, heavenly beings, the highest rebirth. Last week, the Bodhisattva was surrounded by kings, the highest of the human realm, so to speak. The week before that, they were surrounded by all the animals, and they were the lion, the highest of the animal kingdom in that way. The week before that, they had hell realms on either side of them. And so there has been this interesting transcendence of the various levels of rebirth from the hell dweller, animal realm, human realm, and now even the gods have come to, what is it? Respectfully make offerings to the Bodhisattva and listen to the preaching of the Dharma. And so the a beautiful kind of like way that this, this tonight's Dharma talk comes full circle is this, it's this beautiful expression about the Dharma, about Buddhism in that sense, that they say that the Dharma is a teaching for both men and gods. And I alluded to this, I alluded to this at the beginning that this thirst, this tanha, this craving, it's not just a human problem. It's an animal problem. It's a hell dweller problem. It's a ghostly problem. It's a godly problem. The desire thing is samsara. And it's what causes all beings to cycle through all the realms, all the way from the hell dweller up to the heavenly realms. And so this idea of the Dharma mega, the, the cloud of the Dharma that provides this rain of truth that can slake all thirsts is really represented by these even Brahma gods coming and listening to the Dharma from our Bodhisattva. And that's because the Dharma can slake their thirst as well. And I think that that is a, it's a profound message of Buddhism. Uh, it's a message of equanimity in a very interesting way, but it's this really profound message about the profundity of the Dharma, that it's like, do you think you have sensory organs? Come with us. Because <laughs> what I, my joke about is, is hell dwellers have sensory organs, animals have sensory organs, humans have sensory organs, gods have sensory organs, or they think they do, we all do in that sense. And so that sensing and then being like, ooh, that was nice. Give me more is the problem for everybody. Uncontrollable desire is the problem for all realms. And the Dharma is a teaching for that uncontrollable desirability. 
Questions, comments, answers, or ideas? <laughs> Yay. It's raining Dharma. Woo. <laughs> I want a disco. I want a disco song. It's raining Dharma. It's raining Dharma. It's raining Dharma. All right. Any other questions? <laughs> because otherwise, I'm just going to sing badly the rest of the night unless there's questions comments answers or ideas <laughs> all right um I, yeah i'm pretty sure that oh i did have one oh i'll end it with this actually i had one last note it was my my concluding note in parentheses which means if there's time there's time so we get to do it the very so the very last part of this is about this um, these Brahma gods respectfully making offerings to the Bodhisattva here. So I mentioned the that these uh, several times that these thirty two lakshana these thirty two characteristics are a pre Buddhist idea. The Buddhas, the Buddhists get a hold of it and do their crazy poetic shift. And they start talking about the Buddha having a huge tongue. They start talking about light beams coming out of his urna. And not just that, but the light beams have light beams coming out of them. And then on the light beams, on the light beams are these little bodhisattvas. It, you know, it's beautiful the way that they go crazy with these images. Then I mentioned that there's another twist. It's like they twist it and then they twist it further. And a beautiful way that this happens, and this is not the only way, but it's just a very, uh, if you haven't heard this, you'll, you'll like this. So the Vajra Pranya Paramita Sutra, the famous diamond sutra, probably one of, if not the most famous sutra is next to the Heart Sutra, probably. The Vajra Sutra, the Diamond Sutra, is famously divided into 32 little ch chapters. And the reason why it is said that it is divided into those 32 chapters is it says that those are the real Lakshana of the Buddha. Those are the way the Buddha can really be recognized. That's the subtlety of the Mahayana, where to the point where I could say that and, and people are smiling, where it's like, wow, that's really amazing. Yes, it's really beautifully amazing that they, that they go from this really, you know, First of all, they go from a very uh, male anthropocentric model to a very just anthropocentric model to something off the charts, like truly something else in that way. Um, and so I just love sharing with everybody that the Vajra Sutra has these 32 Lakshana or these 32 chapters that are called the real Lakshana of the Buddha. And in that sutra, if you were to read, I don't have my copy with me right here, but towards the end, it's probably in the 20s, I'd say, the chapter around, I don't know, 23, 24, 25, something like that. There's a beautiful part where it says, wherever there is this sutra, meaning the Vajra Sutra, there will be a Buddha and a noble disciple. And that's a, that's a reference to the Buddha being in the sutra, like the real body of the Buddha is in the sutra. And so wherever there is the sutra, there is the teacher, the Buddha, and the student, and the disciple. And then it says, and wherever there is the Buddha and a disciple and the sutra, Brahma gods will come and make offerings at that spot. And so there's a beautiful, like, you know, um, a thing, there's a beautiful thing going on here 
which is this depiction of that moment when the Brahma gods are coming and making offerings to the spot where the sutra is being spoken, being taught. It's happening here. Dharma doors, Sunday nights. So I hope, I hope they're listening. I really truly do. And I think on, on that note, I'm going to call it a, a, a night. But like I said, this is not the end of the sutra. We have just reached the end of the visions of the 10 stages. We still have a little bit to go. Don't worry. It's not going to go on too much longer, but uh, we still have probably a few more nights. Who knows? I'll, maybe I'll try to stretch it to 32 nights. Should I try to stretch it to 32 installments? Six more? We'll see. We'll see. Stay tuned.